Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us in the first of our three part FAIR virtual series. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by Martin Ruhlmacher, Tom Plasterer, Felipe Rocasera, uh, Andreas Bendiani, and Hans Constant. Um, they're going to look at who the stakeholders are involved in driving change management and ask how FAIR is fair enough. But before we start, I'd like to draw your attention to just a couple of things. Firstly, we advise that you use Google Chrome for the best user experience. Um, and then within the platform, you can see to the right hand side that there are the chat features and question features. And um, here you can upload any questions um, for our speakers to answer at the end. We'll make enough time for that. And if you have to drop out of the session at any stage today, remember that you can watch on demand. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Martin to kick us off. Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction. I still you can, I hope you still can all hear me. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks very much. Yeah, uh, I would like to uh, welcome my Did we just lose Martin? We may have. I'm I'm a little bit unstable on my end. So uh, yeah, in case yeah, you lose me again, uh, someone has to chime in. Yeah, I would like to, as um, done before by Megan, I would like to welcome Andrea, Philippe, um, Hans, and Tom uh, here to this panel. And before we start to discuss about how we drive fair in the biopharma industry, I would like to ask all of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves. And let's possibly uh, start with Hans. OK, unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. So, yeah. So, I'm Hans Constant, so uh, the founder of Vontaforce, a company that's working on data, data integration, data visualization. I've got a background in bioinformatics and uh, IT, worked 12 years in pharma, and started my own company to help patients with data and became an entrepreneur by serendipity with the company to build a platform that visualizes linked data. And uh, we'll talk about that, linked data, fair data, semantic web, probably a lot of overlap. So, uh, that's my passion and that's how... Uh, our team is uh, helping Biopharma. Tom, would you like to go next, please? Sure, thanks, Martin. So hi, I'm Tom Plaster. I'm a systems biologist, bioinformatician by training. I uh, have now been at the AstraZeneca for eight years, a little, maybe closer to nine at this point, half of it on the IT side and half of it on the science side. I'm now back over on the science side working with our oncology translational medicine group on their data strategy. Um, it's been a really interesting journey to see how FAIR has taken off within pharma. And one of the things we're trying to do is get earlier in the process and see how we can really make this impact a very data-centric strategy in oncology translational medicine leading toward later stages in the pipeline. So back to you, Martin. Thanks very much. Uh, Philippe, do you want to go next, please? Uh, yeah, thank you, Martin. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Philippe Rocasera. I'm based at the University of Oxford in the Data Readiness Group, led by Professor Sansone. Um, so I'm a biologist by training, and I'm a slash bioinformatician um, and for expert, I guess. Um, so we've been involved. Um, I've been working uh, in Oxford for the last 10 years, and before that, I was at uh, EMB LEBI doing a lot of data processing, data curation in the microarray group, uh, which in a way, gives the, the spin on, on, on this data uh, challenge that we, that we all face. And uh, more recently, obviously, we've been working on, on, the, on the verification of FAIR principle. We are author on the, on, on the manuscript. And uh, actually, I'm currently part of the IMI FAIR Plus, which looks at uh, producing a, a, a set of guidelines for verification of data. Thank you, Philippe. And last but not least, I hand over to Andrea. Hi. I apologize if there is some problem with the connection. I'm traveling, and uh, apparently this spot is not so good as I hoped it would have been. So I'm Andres Splendiani. I've been uh, working on semantic web and ontology in the life science for a while. And I joined Novartis about six years ago to work on, on uh, essentially verification, right? I spent the first five years in research. And then uh, since about 20 years, I'm actually working at the corporate level to drive the um, verification strategy of Novartis. Thank you, Andrea. I hope this was, yeah, okay. Yeah, and last but not least, I will introduce myself. So, my name is uh, Martin Romacher. I have been working with Roche for seven and a half years now in pharma research, early development informatics. 
And I'm <clears throat> mainly active in the area of uh, terminology management, um, ontology design, but also data, standardiz data standardization, data curation, uh, data quality. And I think more recently, we do believe that uh, the fair data principles are kind of a key strategy to manage our data management um, value chain. And by doing so, we have uh, a couple of interesting internal and external collaborations to verify our data. So after the introductions, I briefly would like to um, kick off the topic. So we all assume that you have a certain level of acquaintance with the FAIR data principles, where FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And we thought to uh, bring the topic a little bit closer at the beginning, we would like to call out uh, a couple of resources that have been around in the uh, public space. The first one will be uh, the FAIR toolkit that uh, has been crafted by the Pistoia Alliance in the uh, implementation of FAIR data principles in life science R&D project. And then Philip will follow with a short view on uh, <clears throat> the FAIR cookbook and the FAIR sharing platform that is maintained by the University of Oxford. So the Pistoia Alliance is a non-for-profit organization where uh, different pharma, but also vendors and academia collaborate to foster collaboration in life science R&D. And there is a set of important projects going on there. Uh, and since uh, last year, we have been working on uh, the uh, implementation of the FAIR data principles. And one of the key deliverables we have uh, put on production uh, only recently is the FAIR toolkit. We will share the web address uh, later on because um, we obviously have some bandwidth issues here and we cannot directly demonstrate the site. So it's uh, fairtoolkit.ospistoyalliance.org. And uh, the FAIR toolkit is, is um, supposed to be a kind of a one-stop shop where you will find all the information that um, are needed if you would like to embark in the in the FAIR story. So it's really something that is uh, geared towards specific roles in your organization, like data stewards, uh, lab scientists, data scientists, business analysts, and science managers. And we have uh, a couple of different resources that you may want to look into. So first of all, we are looking into uh, the FAIR principles and the life science industry uh, as, a, as a whole looking also uh, what the FAIR guiding principles are, why FAIR data is so important to our organizations, and how we practically support the creation of FAIR um, data. There is a section about methods. I think this is, this is quite important that it contains, on the one hand, uh, the FAIR maturity indicators, also referred to as the, the FAIR metrics, where you can uh, uh, determine to what extent you have been successfully implemented uh, the fair data principles in your organization around the four letters. There are also more, there's also more information around uh, data management plans and data granularity and uh, context. And uh, to uh, say, uh, make it a little bit more tangible, there is also a page around the different use cases that have been implemented in the industry. There's a very interesting one coming from AstraZeneca about URI policies. There's also something about data sharing from our colleagues from Bayer. But also, quite importantly, there are also contributions from um, SMEs to uh, illustrate how they help the industry to implement the FAIR data principles. So if you are interested in the topic, if you would like to have a good starting point, then please refer to the FAIR toolkit at the Pistoia Alliance. We will share the link as mentioned before after this meeting. And with this, I would like to hand over to uh, my colleague, uh, Philip, to talk a little bit about uh, the cookbook and uh, also FAIR sharing. Um, yeah, thank you, Martin. Um, so I will start with uh, the, the FAIR cookbook, uh, which is, uh, in a way, the, the, the outcome or the, the product of the IMI FAIR Plus project. This is the, the kind of uh, the main product that we'll be delivering. And very similar to the, uh, the, the FAIR toolkit that has just been mentioned by Martin, I think the focus of, of, of this book is to document a set of uh, protocols of each targeting each of the letters of the FAIR acronym um, along the, the pathway to the verification process with uh, providing hands-on practicals. So most of the uh, the recipes, to use this kind of metaphor, uh, will be uh, detailing with hands-on executable code sections or for the ETL uh, of what happens in, uh, along this journey. And again, 
we will organize the navigation of the book uh, primarily along the lines of the FAIR principles, but also uh, one of the uh, key uh, aspects is we need to engage the right person and be able to direct the right uh, um, persona to the right recipes. And, and this will also be part of, of the work that we need to do um, uh, to make sure that people understand the value uh, of, of the book. My colleague Andrea Spelliani is also part of this project, and uh, in a way, uh, we are trying to build some of the uh, capability model, maturity model within the cookbook, so that people can understand uh, after executing a recipe uh, where they stand. Um, another aspect that has been already mentioned is the issue of uh, how do we evaluate fairness at a scale, and I think this is this is a, a key aspect of the work. Um, there are tools developed by Mark Wilkinson, for instance, the fair evaluator, but also uh, other group like uh, Avi Mayam's group, the fair toolkit, for instance, which allow you to have a feel for the level of, of maturity that you have achieved following a recipe. Um, so that's, that's the main area where we work at the moment. But my colleagues in the same team at Oxford uh, my colleagues Susanna Sansone and Pete Malkilton are actually looking after another resource, which is called Fair Sharing. And Fair Sharing is uh, should be seen as a, is a registry that lists um, a number of life science data standards. And by this, I mean uh, syntax, you know, um, such as uh, MZML for mass spectrometry, for instance, and control vocabulary terminologies which are used um, in, in the area. These could be uh, vocabulary such as the, uh, the gene ontology and all the related obo foundry efforts, but also a bunch of other resources which are uh, really needed by uh, di in, in different contexts, for instance. And by context, I mean um, uh, the, the kind of area where you operate. Uh, so if you are working in basic research, you probably use a different stack of standards than uh, the one that are used in clinical trials, for instance, or clinical context. And in a way, this is what uh, we would like to, to to deliver with fair sharing is a kind of navigation tool to direct people uh, to identify first in, when they produce a data management plan, for instance, which are the, the repositories, uh, the data archives that are most relevant to them. And once they've identified that, they can navigate through the links that we maintain in the fair sharing repositories to the different data standards that are implemented at each of these repositories to give a feel of what a kind of, uh, 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 in a way, path they need to take uh, if they wish to deposit or public, uh, publish their data sets. Um, so I stop here. I think I don't want to eat too much time. But um, yes, I will share the links with these resources. Um, uh, as we agreed. Uh, thank you very much, Philippe. I mean, it's uh, very good to see that there's a lot of progress to build um, semantic infrastructure that we can use on our verification journey. And the first question I would like to ask to the panel is, um, what is your sentiment where we are currently in the verification journey? So is there any big achievement that you see that you are possibly also proud of where you have participated on the one hand, and where would you still see, say, uh, major obstacles or major challenges that we would need to face uh, to uh, continue bringing the fair data principles into our organizations, but also, of course, beyond in the public space? And uh, if I may, can I ask Tom to uh, reply first? Sure. Thanks, Martin. Um, so wonderfully set up uh, by Philippe and Martin. Um, I think one of the really nice achievements is the toolkit. Um, so that's one of the first places I would I would take a look at. Um, and I, I think the cookbook is not too far behind, but that's really about sort of the approach and sort of bringing things together so that we can go from the four letters into the you know, 15 sub principles, just to kind of get you a sense on how to get started on this journey from a, a technical standpoint. Um, within the company, we've been able to uh, use fair data approaches, sort of more of a use case driven approach to set up a couple of knowledge graphs, one in competitive intelligence and uh, one in translational medicine. And so they're, they're very much focused up from the standpoint of let's try to solve a particular problem, whether it's uh, integrating uh, omics data in the clinic or whether it's understanding um, competitors against our, our particular targets. And, and we found sort of that's a nice sweet spot. So collect your use cases, build them small. 
uh, take advantage of public ontologies and make your own uh, ontology build as small as possible to address these questions. So, so I, I think that's one place where we, we've seen um, some success. Um, from a challenges standpoint, I, I think one of the real um, first things that has to happen is that people have to understand why is this important for them? You know, what are they going to be able to get out of it? How does this get them to help change their behaviors? And um, you know, this is fair is, is to some extent seen as something that's come out of the academic systems biology community. So the relevance to pharma and the need to sort of change the ocean liner as it's moving along so that you can adopt these new patterns, I think is something that you have to give both the, the carrots right away and then hopefully get buy-in from senior management so you have some sticks as well. Um, I think that's been one of the things in um, our journey toward FAIR and one of the reasons I was really excited to have this panel come together is I think all of us have looked at it slightly differently from a slightly different perspective, hit it from a slightly different part of the organization or outside of the organization. And so, you know, having, um, you know, Philip and both his academic work and his work within Elixir and Fair Plus is, and also, you know, looking at what happens in, say, Go Fair with Baron Mons, Eric Schultes is sort of, um, you know, this is where you guys can go. Uh, having support with organizations like Hans and with Ontoforce and many other great organizations in this space that can show how this gets materialized is a really nice pattern for, for those of us that are trying to um, get this adopted inside to be able to see where we can go with this and the sort of things that we can achieve. Um, so that maybe I'll, I'll hand that uh, either back to Andrea or, or Martin for that perspective or, or potentially um, Hans, if you want to pick it up because you've been sort of trying to pull us in this direction for a while. Yeah, let's go with Hans. Would you want to jump in Hans, please? Yeah, can you hear me? I'm muted now, I guess. Yes, we can. Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction here. Um, good starting. So uh, couldn't agree more with what Tom was saying, right? So um, I think what we see is um, these initiatives like Fair Plus and uh, the Pistoia Alliance IMI, they bring people together who are like-minded, who want to do more with data. In Fair Data is, of course, hot right now. But uh, to materialize this, that, that's the key, right? That's also why I founded Ontoforce, because I've worked in pharma and I was a little bit frustrated uh, that people were not always listening, you know? So I started a company myself. The reason why is you need to bring value from data. And that is also the topic here, I, I think, on this panel is um, how do I enable this transformation, this change that is fair data is even brought to value? So materializing what's been done in these initiatives, like all these public ontologies. So we have like 150 public ontologies, which we keep up to date for free. And then linking that up uh, using the, the, the FAIR tools and the FAIR toolkit and other stuff, linking that up with internal data and materializing that for internal users brings value very quickly. And to come back to the first part of your question, Martin, is successes. We've seen successes where the target was like 1,000 users. And we're at this point at 1,700 users in a company where there's a, a 4,000 users. And, and I think people see the value. The strange thing though, is that we see that people only use a tool for two to five minutes. And in the beginning, this was a little bit, uh, well, what's happening? Because you, you want as an IT person, you want your tool to be used as, mu as much as possible because that's a success. But uh, the business sponsor said, no, 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 this is working great because all data is in one place. It's linked, it's easy, it has URIs, and they don't call it URIs. But they said, we understand the nomenclatures and we can link to other data. And, and that's the magic for them. And they can find their answers in five to seven minutes. So that's where you tap into where the, the greatest sponsors are, right? It's people in the business, head of business oncology, and for instance, certain companies, and they really like it. So these were successes we saw, and then you can use the external data, the URIs, the ontologies, uh, all the verification that happens to enrich internal data and to make it linkable. And that's where we see a lot of successes with data lakes that were data swamps not accessible. And now with a fair verification of the data, and then of course with the UX UI we bring to the game is to, to really make it nice and accessible for people. We've seen some challenges. We can come back to that later where um, what we see is who owns uh, who owns this. So uh, when you come in with, with fair data and, and with a search engine on top of that, uh, we see a lot of stakeholders and that's a difficulty we see a lot is one success is there. And I think Tom, you also alluded to that and I'm interested also to learn from Andrea and Martin and, and Philip is 
what I've seen where it fails is when there's too much excitement from the beginning, strangely enough, and the thing too big, and then there's too many chiefs in the kitchen and you're like a year and a half debating on who owns it and nothing happens. And so what I see is uh, I think AstraZeneca and we've worked together, they do it very nicely with small projects, deliver success to one team, then another team, and then it grows automatically. But a failure I have seen is when you have it too big from the beginning, too many stakeholders, then it seems to fail also. Yeah, thanks very much for sharing your insights and possibly if you could also get a little bit the perspective from our champ in the academic space. I mean, you have been working for a long, long time in this area, Philip. So how, what is your perception from the from the academic space? Are the things coming together? Do we have successes? What are still the major objects, obstacles you would like to uh, get rid of in the next uh, couple of years? I, um, yes, I think you're giving me too much credit for many things here, but uh, <laughs> I would be much more humble. But uh, I, I'd say that from the successes, I, I would say uh, the collaborative effort of the Obo Foundry ontologies, for instance, where there was an attempt. I mean, there is a, a, a kind of echo of the Obo Foundry principles to organize uh, interoperable resources that could work together. And one of the key aspects of the work for this resource over the last 10 years was to de develop tools that would allow uh, automatic processing and assessment of, an, of these resources and, and identifying um, the, the, the most cost-effective interactions. And already this has produced an ecosystem that is extremely successful. And um, but the associated uh, lesson that has been learned is that without proper level of funding and, 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 and support, these, these efforts are extremely slow to deliver. Um, so that, that's, that's an aspect that I, I think is an obstacle, the, the right, finding the right uh, level of resourcing. Um, and then associated to that is the risk of fragmentation. So we could all work on verification solutions, which would deliver uh, linked data that are not linked, essentially, because we use completely different uh, vocabularies. And then we, we we are somehow failing as well. So we would have to watch out for uh, these kind of things and how we can bridge the different islands of, of, uh, of vocabularies uh, in a better way. These are many efforts on the way already. Uh, uh, yeah, by the way, that there already is some questions coming in on the yeah. chat. I think there's one here which fits very well also to what you uh, have been saying, uh, Philippe, is where can we find the consolidated ontologies across the pharma domain? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so <laughs> if you may answer to this uh, or someone else, uh, where, where is this consolidated ontology sp uh, space for the entire pharma domain? I mean, you mentioned some stuff, but maybe you can just uh, comment on this, Philip, please. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's another one that is difficult in a way because we, we've mapped the landscape of what is open and accessible and, and, and really documented. I think. Uh, uh, for for the farmer, you probably you, you are the, the one who can who can comment more. I think a lot of this could be worked pre-competitively, possibly, and they could see huge benefits. I think the Pistoia Alliance has already worked wonders in that area. I, I've been talking to many of the members, and and I think there are really strong signals here that um, uh, these efforts could go a long, long way. And, and I think the question also very nicely uh, gives the keyword. I think everybody understands that if you move towards FAIR, there is a need uh, for consolidation. So we need to have uh, a controlled ontology space, uh, not too many URIs for the same object, but it's still it's still a long journey. And um, yeah, we, I think we have taken this up, but I wouldn't expect that we have a solution in the next uh, one, one or two years. So finally, I would also like to hand over to, to Andrea shortly to comment on on his perspective on on, on fair um, how do you perceive uh, the current status of the fair data principles um, in the industry in your own organization andrea you are still on mute so, are you? I, I, yeah 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 so i think the fair principle are well accepted yeah i think everybody especially from senior management understand the importance of having fair data you know, our company has the ambition of becoming a data science driven company. So the fact that you need data in a proper shape to, to drive this ambition is key, is clear, right? This is clear. Now, the question that I asked maybe is how do you do it? Yeah? So, and, and this is a thing where we still have a bit of gaps and friction because uh, what is 
actually they offer two verify data, both in terms of uh, technologies, right, solutions, and those in terms of skills. Because, I mean, if you think fair data is something easy to understand as a very superficial level, right? But the next step when you need to go deep into it is actually not that easy anymore, right? So how do you even try to hire an ontologist? Yeah? So what kind of professional figures do you need? Where do you find them? There are not that many. Yeah? So there is really a problem of, of skills if you want to go deep into this verification journey. And also if you think in terms of uh, you know, technology providers, there are a few, small typically, right? Do they give you the same reliability and enterprise scale as some of the major players around? Possibly not, right? You need to consider that, okay, fair data is good, but also reliability is good, support is good, price is good, right? <laughs> so in the overall package, what actually is the offer? It's probably not that big. Yeah? So I think we have really this bandwidth issues in materializing fair data at the moment, both in terms of skills and in terms of the but technology solution provider offer, yeah. It's good for small scale things, right? For small scale thing, maybe yes, you find the success story. But when you go beyond that, I think, uh, yes, you're still, uh, we still have a lack of, of bandwidth. Yeah. That's my main impression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks very much, Andrea. I think it pretty much also is in line what, what I wanted to say, what I can shorten now. Uh, I think that the fair data principles uh, as such certainly have uh, taken off because, of course, it's a, it's a very nice acronym. It's easy to remember. You can do nice word games with it. Uh, but at the end of the day, the question is, um, to what extent have our organizations uh, really understood what are, what are the implications if you would like to go fair? And Andrea, you also hi highlighted already some of the issues uh, that, that you see. Um, but yeah, I, I just would like to give this this question back again to to the panel to ask: um, Do our organizations, do the majority of the people we work with, uh, really understand how deep fair goes, and uh, what do we need to do to make them understand what data verification really means in terms of the way the capabilities that we have, the way that we work, the way how we organize our processes. And again, I think uh, Andrea brought up some topics like what are the skills which are required? So a very long question, but it would be great to if you could share your, your, your insights on this. So I'm looking here for the first volunteer. So I, I can jump in on that one, Martin. Um, I think the answer, the short answer is no. I mean, the, the downstream implications of what it means to really have a data centric driven, fair data driven organization hasn't really hit everybody yet. So I think it's all just sort of a matter of what your viewpoint is and sort of how does this affect you? Um, I, I think the, the marketing, the four letters is really as you've suggested. Uh, people see that, they get it, they see that as being a potential solution to a problem. But the fact that it sort of came out as the fair principles with the four main principles and the 15 sub principles without really routes about how you do it is both good and bad. So there's more than one way to do it. And then that allows lots of different perspectives on how you can reach that and what it means when your data is fair and fair for what purpose. And I, I think we're going to get into that a little bit more later. Um, but if I'm looking at this from a stakeholder standpoint, it can be a very different perspective that you just have to align. Uh, if I'm thinking about it from sort of an enterprise IT perspective, you know, things come up like, how does FAIR help me with master data management? How does FAIR help me with reference data management? How does FAIR help me with the thousand applications that I have to maintain? And so it's, it's a different perspective that you have to figure out how, when you make things FAIR, when you make things data centric, when you start thinking about an interoperable data layer that feeds everything, that that changes how different stakeholders are going to interact with it. So that, that's sort of one example around, you know, enterprise IT and R&D IT. From another perspective, you know, dealing with some of my, my colleagues uh, in early oncology, you're seeing the same things regardless. Of, they want to go fast. They want to take advantage of whatever academic collaborations are out there, whatever their measurement modalities are out there, ways of interfering with systems, ways of developing new therapies. So for them, it's don't do anything that's going to slow us down and we'll get to reuse when we get to it. And so it's, it's how do you put the uh, guardrails on so that you enable and facilitate reuse so you don't duplicate effort while going at the speed of science. 
And so I think you're looking at two really different challenges there that FAIR can help with, but you have to really show the road and, and how those two different paths can be facilitated uh, by better data stewardship and by a little bit more upfront thinking about how your data is born, how it's, you know, quote unquote, born FAIR. I think it's going to be really helpful for both ends of the spectrum. Thanks, Tom. Someone else would like to, to comment on this question? I think a very broad question, of course. I mean, there is an aspect that, um, so we talk about fair data, right? But as uh, Tom mentioned, I mean, in some part of the company, maybe they talk about MDM and uh, reference data, right? So it's also a question of tuning the message um, to the right uh, environment, yeah? And I think this goes together with the maturity model. So, you know, FAIR is a very aspirational thing. If you talk to about FAIR in uh, areas that don't even have an MDM, maybe it's a bit too much, right? <laughs> so it's a question of also understanding uh, each part of the company where they are, right? And what is the next step? I think this, this tuning of, uh, of uh, you know, what to present in terms of FAIR, in terms of uh, next step in a, uh, you know, journey to our FAIR, I think is important to, to make people understand or to connect to the idea. Yeah. I also would agree that, for example, having the uh, the fair metrics uh, that is able to do a kind of a maturity as assessment is, is very helpful here because it can uh, tell you where you are in the journey. So instead of having a kind of an intuitive notion uh, where you are, I mean, I have heard uh, many times that people made the claim that their data are fair but then if you look into it from a fair metrics perspective, they're only partially fair. And I think this is possibly also the, uh, say, um, the, the art to really bring this into the business because it's not about, you know, judging um, the quality of the data or putting someone on, on the wall of shame. It's really, how, how can we support our organization in making this, this transformation? And I think this transformation also really goes into the topic of the digital transformation because at least this is my personal take, uh, digitalization will fail if we don't uh, uh, apply it based on the fair data principles, because we will accumulate more electronic garbage that doesn't help us. So um, uh, I think we have some means here. I think the issue with the fair metrics, for example, is, and this is something we are struggling with in our organization, is they are completely technical. And I think there are also some questions around this. So how, uh, popping up here on the questions channel, I think, how do we bring these principles closer to, to normal people who are producing data, who are uh, data scientists, also creating repositories, that they understand uh, the, the fair data principles in a, in a human understandable way and not in something which is called out in, in, in the fair metrics. So we have been working, for example, internally on some uh, domain-specific translations into questions that would uh, that a normal data producer would be able um, to answer. But still, I would say that, uh, say, the depth of the understanding what data verification really means is not um, fully um, spread out into our organizations. And um, one of the topics that came up was also, and it's also something which is related to some of the questions here on the on the questions channel is, um, I think, um, I think Philippe mentioned it or, or Tom, I think it's about that the fair stuff really comes more out of the research space. But of course, there are many other parts in the organization that would like to go fair now. And they are asking, okay, where are my resources? Uh, do, is there a fair sharing for mass data? Is there a fair sharing for uh, competitive intelligence data? Are there any standards? So what advice would we give to those people who would like to embark into the fair journey where we still uh, do not have too much resources or where we cannot say, okay, please uh, take standard X, Y, Z and apply it to make your data fair? I mean, most of us are from research, so it might be a difficult, difficult question. <laughs> but at least, what would you be your kind of uh, say take on it? Maybe I think something has been alluded to by by Tom in a way. I, I think try as much as you can to reuse what already exists and see if it if it already works for what you have. I mean, there is. I mean starting to create an, your own ontology and you will at the beginning it's exciting it's fun 
but then you realize you need to maintain it over time and it's 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 really expensive somehow but contributing if you find something that is close enough and you can find ways to submit your terms or your needs uh, then then you you rely on an infrastructure to, to to produce this and so contributing to an existing standard or trying to see what how you can adjust, adapt what already exists to your own need is a starting point that could lower the costs yeah i, I would i would fully agree because i mean regardless where you are say in in, in a pharma company for example uh, also we are we are possibly in discovery we are in development we are in manufacturing we are in, in marketing there is still a, a large set of uh, say entities that we share like organizations measurement units uh, lab lab tests and so on and so forth and i fully agree with you philip that i think reusing uh, what is existing not creating an additional standard also trying to uh, say put an emphasis on interoperability in the design phase which we have a data management plan and not downstream and everything has been crafted that's that's certainly a solution but on the other hand i think it, it would be uh, good if uh, some of these communities uh, would also start to to build their own resources and of course try to uh, to to connect with um, say the existing repositories as much as possible I, I want to add on top of that, right? So um, what I've seen is also even in the food industry, they start to use fair data. So it's kind of interesting to see that it even goes beyond uh, biopharma as such. Um, it's definitely true what, what uh, Philip is saying, right? Uh, I'm a huge fan of what Dean Alleming said in the old semantic web days. A little semantics can get you a long way. So I, I think this is also where I see failures is where people take a technical approach in where they start to over-engineer their ontologies and never agree on that, and then nothing happens, right? And it's a kind of an intellectually very interesting debate, uh, but there's no result. So I think, Philippe, if you agree on that, but what I agree with Philippe on is to start with a small ontology, build something, and we've seen successes where it's not only research, but also from outside research. And one of the nice examples to, to explain, and that comes back to an earlier question that was not really answered is, we're all tech geeks, so so we like to talk about tech. We we like to get our hands dirty, work on ontologies, make nice tools. But this makes IT excited, but doesn't make the business user excited, right? And so what we saw uh, a, a big success was where we used like a very simple approach with HR data to to have the key the expert locator to, uh, use case. And so Adontaforce with the Discover platform, we're able to, to implement it in, in days and weeks. It's a very simple ontology. Everybody understands it and we're able to link like to publications, to patterns with internal data. And that was a real nice example of fair data where reusability of internal data and interoperability was, was crucial. And so there's also, we see Adontaforce when we do implementations with the Discover platform, this interoperability and reusability, when you apply that very quickly with the UI on top of it, you get to success very quickly. But to that point, start small, think big, but start small, because if you start big, then I, I think it will fail. Yeah. I, I, sorry, Tom, you would like to go? No, no, I was just gonna pick up from one of Hans's point and just to make it super clear, I mean, if you're building your own disease ontology, you should stop. I mean, if you, if you wanna add a couple of terms because you have a particular view on an indication, great. But I mean, otherwise, I mean, there's a, a number of them that are like that. They're really mature, good in the, in the public domain. You should just adapt to them. And that'll make your life so much easier. You're not gonna need a huge staff of librarians around to keep this up. Your challenge is then gonna be how do you string together uh, questions across existing really good uh, domain ontologies already. Absolutely. And, and I think that's, that's a much better approach. I think we are going around one topic here because all, all the messages, touch about uh, the availability of some public data, right? Some shared data, yeah? So when you're in research, there is a, you know, a good corpus of shared ontologies and other resources that you can use to conversion verification, but out of research, this is not the case, right? So how do you do verification of uh, procurement information, yeah? Do you have an open list of uh, suppliers? Possibly not. So I wonder if uh, we need this kind of uh, open resources as catalyzers for verification, right? Beyond research. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think there are also uh, some initiatives in the supply chain area. I just had a contact last week with someone who actually wants to do exactly what you mentioned here, Andrea, to really create a public repository of supplier data that not uh, all, the, all the different companies have to do this uh, on their own. I think this is really uh, possibly also the one of the most promising areas for pre-competitive uh, collaboration. I also would like to go just briefly back to, to a, an important point that Hans has made. So also from a Roche perspective, uh, I remember that, for example, we had uh, some data models describing essays, and we had roughly uh, 1,500 attributes to describe the essays. And then uh, this is exactly tried to boil the ocean. And then we actually turned out, so what are possibly the 10 or 15 key properties that would allow us to unambiguously identify essays, describe an essay, and possibly where you also would be able to say, this is something where the information elements are mandatory. Because most of the data matrices that we had were very sparse because uh, for some of the, of, the, of, the, of the variables, you just had uh, a value once in a time. I think this is, this is also possibly on our end, one of the key success factors internally that we try to focus on these minimal models, of course, design them in the right way with the best practices, but not, uh, <laughs> I have to just to laugh because it's really when you are, of course, in this area, you like to do this, um, you know, big animals that are complex, but actually what is the business problem that we would like to solve? I think th this, is, this is really the key question. Um, I just would like to, again, if I may pick up one or two questions coming up here from the from the questions channel. So one, what someone has been asking, do you have examples for helping with data generated by, by CROs? I would like to mention here that we have uh, an example on the uh, uh, FAIR toolkit uh, from Roche, where we have exactly been addressing this, uh, this issue, where we automatically uh, verify data as we are consuming it from CROs. So, it was Mark who asked this. You may want to take a look at this uh, this, this resource. Um, and um, I think now there are, there are many, many uh, questions coming in. And possibly I would like to turn the topic more towards this direction about about uh, people uh, and, and roles. So um, uh, here, for example, uh, what is the type of people, roles, and capabilities you need to implement and drive fair? Uh, is the rule of thumb how big a, a team should be? There's also a question, how do we, uh, say, influence uh, the, the data producers? Uh, how do we create values, influence the, the values for, for the stakeholders? So possibly moving a little bit away from the more technical formal aspects from, uh, from of FAIR and driving FAIR in biopharma, let's move a little bit more towards the soft topics like um, processes and people. Uh, so. Can someone start to give uh, some perspective on how they have been addressing these two dimensions in their approach to verify their data landscape? So, so I guess I can start and then Martin, I'm gonna quickly send this back to you because I think you and I are approaching it from different directions and, and I think it's it's a, an important consideration. So a lot of what we've done in the past has been from the use case on up. And so we sort of very narrowly define the sort of use cases, a lot of them in translational medicine or in competitive intelligence. Um, so we have a sense of how are we gonna solve a problem that builds on the next problem that builds on the next problem and so forth. And with the underlying model being basically a knowledge graph, the use cases get solved by paths through that graph. And so the teams that you need aren't that big. And so you usually need, you know, business analysts slash scientist that understands that question really well. Uh, you usually need a couple of modelers, uh, both for the, the data side, uh, to be able to figure out what is your semantic model to be able to do it, as well as a data engineer that's going to be able to help the transformation. And you need a, a publishing route, so a way to be able to publish that uh, either, you know, could be Spotfire, uh, it could be really nice dashboards and Discover, it could be wherever, so you have that route. So. So that sort of minimal team from a well-defined use case isn't that big. I mean, it's you know it's six to ten people depending on skills and how they work together. But then the problem is, you know, does this become a game of whack-a-mole? I mean, how well does that sort of bottom-up approach scale? Um, the, the nice thing is that you're able to get immediate feedback that you're in the right direction and you're able to do it in an agile way. Uh, but when you start talking about really big use cases or you start running into um, you know issues around GDPR, for example. And how do you do something like that with patient data in a knowledge graph where consent could be withdrawn? I mean, those sort of questions 
me and your team of eight to 10 scrappy veterans running full speed, probably gonna need some help. So, so I know what you've done um, is a different approach, which might be closer to solving that. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um... <laughs> Uh, I think we have a little bit started to to building uh, some capabilities early on, even before the Fed and principles were coined and now coming from the ideas of, of linked data, which were there earlier on, but I think they're closely tied into the fair data principles. And indeed, I think we'd, we'd really try to tackle this from, from, two, from two sides. So one is, uh, there's also a related question here, we really try to heavily collaborate with data producers to really enable them to produce a fair data from the very beginning. And this is really an educational process. So we don't want to constrain or to force someone. We want to convince people. We really would like to show them the benefit um, when they are producing fair data. And I think an, an important point that you may also hear frequently in your organizations is that yeah, if I need to do it, I, I don't have the time. It takes too much of my time. So this is possibly the IT challenge to really bring this in a seamless way into the way how people work. So producing fair data doesn't uh, take longer. And at the same point, I think you closely need to work together with uh, the IT organization, where there's possibly a slight tendency to bypass us. Uh, again, I think it's some, an area where we try to, to convince people, where we try to go an enlightened, an enlightened path. and. Um, also, in the early days, we really started with, with early adopters. And I think when you really have a, a range and, and more and more people uh, uh, buy in, then you reach a point where your activities are, are recommended. So we have really, uh, in the first place, built this very, very bottom up with a high level of integration of, of URIs, for example, already in our applications. And I think now we are getting uh, the tailwind uh, from uh, getting the support from the executive level. And I think as a whole, this picture really now have resulted in possibly the most exciting um, situation we ever had. Uh, I also still say, okay, if we now really have this opportunity, we also would need uh, to ensure that we really do it right now. That we're doing uh, the, the fair implementation um, right. So having said this, um, a, a very, very important theme to us is also that by doing all this different work, we really would like to heavily uh, collaborate pre-competitively because there are so many issues that we encounter every day in our um, verification efforts that we cannot solve as a company. We cannot solve it just because we don't have the resources and we cannot solve it because we simply shouldn't solve it because uh, standards, linked data, fair data is uh, based on, on, on community efforts, which doesn't mean that all the data is, is, is uh, open or public or not private, but the principles to build the repositories, this is something that we can definitely do in a pre-competitive way. Mm -hmm. I want to add to that is uh, we, we already work with some big CROs. If we see that they're also buying into fair data and definitely the concepts, right? So maybe with CROs, it's not so much about fair data as such. I think it's very pharma R&D driven, that, that kind of hype, I would say. Uh, but uh, the interoperability and reusability of data is, is really crucial, right? So we see a lot of uh, things happening there, uh, not under the fair data umbrella. So I'm pointing these companies also to the Pistoia Alliance, right? To see if they also would join, because I think there would be great interest to do that. And then secondly, uh, to come back to, to, the, to the question here is, we've seen a success. So there's two companies not represented here in the panel, but Big Pharma, where we've seen that they had like 12 to 14 employees working on kind of cleaning up all the public data. And it's exactly like you said, Martin, in the beginning is they were kind of making all their own ontologies and it looked brilliant, but it was not sustainable. And so because of reorganization, the, the manager was forced to, to fire like 80% of his team. And so we started working with them and, and, and we, at this point, they're managed with two people, but they're active in Pistoia Alliance. They reuse what's out there. And instead of recreating themselves, they start small and they build on top of that. And it's a big win there. And it's a big example of saying, look, we thought we probably would have had to grow the team from 12 to 20 FTEs. And now they do it with two FTEs. And yes, Tom, to your point, you need to start small with use cases to, to show value instantly. Because what I see is when business people come in the room, is they're afraid of IT, how long will this project take, right? And it's again, it, it was five-star data, then was linked data, then was semantic web, now it's fair data, what's next, guys? And so uh, you need to come up with some actual use cases. And I, I even call them showcases 
And when you can do that small, then you build the momentum. And I think it's happening at Roche Martin. We talk also, but then you get the tailwind at some point. You need to have some small successes with some good business sponsors. And then, and then, and then we see things happening. But uh, again, what I'm really very uh, proud of in a certain way is that we see that teams now don't need these huge teams to do all of, all of them themselves. We point them in the right directions. They start to collaborate pre-competitively. The ontologies are the same, and then they apply that, and they, we, we see that they get a lot of tailwind and uh, good results there. I think you're making an important point here, Hans, because if, if you really apply these, these engineering principles uh, for data verification based on the practices we have established using ontologies, terminologies, you, you don't have to have this overarching um, strategic model that combines everything. You can really do it. I think also mm -hmm. Tom is working this way at AstraZeneca. You can really, really do small domain models. But as they are built on on, on shared URIs, shared model, they, uh, I mean, I've also seen use cases at Roche that the uh, the integration of this data comes for free, mm -hmm. as you're Absolutely. Teaching, which is incredible. Yep. But you have it, you have to build it uh, right from the very beginning. And um, I mean, a very simple principle has been called out already um, many times is reuse standards. So, um, and if someone has crafted, um, can be an external or an internal resource, reuse it and if you really create a new resource you have to have uh, a process where this gets approved otherwise again knowledge pro will proliferate and that's a maybe principle here. um and it, it's kind of coming out of the semantic web but i think it's pretty applicable it's, it's cooperation without coordination and so it's it's how do you do sort of just enough with your plumbing and with your semantics so that things work and people can develop separately and so it's it's for, for, to me, that's the two most important things are get your URIs right, so you know how to find things, you know how to name things, and get agreement on the minimum number of vocabulary around interoperability. And, and if you do that, then you can allow different groups to go off and develop on their own, because they'll be able to come back together around those two things. Yeah, I, I haven't heard that one, but I really like it. I think that that's really that's really the key. I mean, they really have um, the same understanding how you would model your, uh, your um, content, and then if it comes into integration federation, it um, usually uh, is uh, coming with, a, with 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 low effort or even sometimes with with no effort if you have done it right from the yeah, very both beginning. Both credit for that. We should go to David Wood. So he's one of the original authors of the RDF spec. So that that one's not mine. That's David's. Yeah, and I think this also, uh, of course, uh, uh, say uh, applies to. Um, uh, say resources that we could own as an industry. I mean, you, you also may know that there is currently another Pistoia project going on where we try to uh, jointly annotate uh, bioassays. And instead of what Hans mentioned, is that every company does this locally uh, over and over again. Let's bundle the resources. And I think the, the, the result that we create should be uh, completely public, open, accessible, but it will be based on community standard. It will use minimum models and it will have clear commitments about what vocabularies to use to represent this kind of knowledge. Any more thoughts on this? Um, there's also a little bit of question around around knowledge graphs. So, um, how would you see the relationship between, say, knowledge graphs and and fair data? Yeah, I, I think this is uh, knowledge graphs are the killer use case for fair data. <laughs> Killer in the is positive it, or in the negative sense? <laughs> that is hopefully in a positive sense. But, uh, this, this is knowledge graphs as an integration play, but you can also think about knowledge graphs as an analytic play being set up by the integration play. And so if you get your plumbing right around your URIs um, and you get your semantics right, then I think you can set up the knowledge graphs really, really well. Absolutely. I can only confirm what Tom is saying. So what we see is when we come into companies, so sometimes we come into a company and they have not a lot of verified data, then you can put a knowledge graph on top of that, but then it shows how bad the data is, how unfair the data is. And it's really a, a smash in their face. And then typically they take a three, six, nine months to, to start curating the data. When we come into a company where they have already verified data and they have nice URIs, then the data becomes linkable by definition, right? This is the whole linked data concept. And then 
the knowledge graph is indeed in a positive way the killer use case because then people tap in like it's like that expert locator use case they tap in their hr data and it links to publications to patents to other stuff they they link in their erp data or sap data and that also links or a data lake or some legacy data and when it's annotated it all starts to come together and that's what the scientists love so the the knowledge graph is indeed and then we're also a fan of it at uh, at uh, ontofos and discoverers build on that our platform but that's a beautiful use case but of course crap in is crap out so if you have unfair data you won't see a lot of nice things but when you have verified data it's really beautiful and it, it helps scientists a lot Thanks for this. I think we are also uh, have still five minutes left. Andrea or Philip, do you want to add something? I have a, a very short closing question to all of you. Uh, if you would like to have make a comment, otherwise I would just ask you this uh, short closing question. Maybe what, what one addition that we discussed with Andrea during the Fair Plus project. I mean, one of the, the key thing, and it touches on the knowledge graph, I think one of the key challenges that we have at the moment is to demonstrate, to have this kind of showcases that was mentioned by Hans, where we we have verified the data, but how do we demonstrate value? And having the ability to connect with data sets together is what we should probably broadcast much more widely. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, wanted to ask uh, Andrea as well, but he seems to have lost his uh, connection for a second. So um, yeah, maybe uh, before handing back to to Megan for for closing this. Uh, so um, if I had a magic stick and I would give you one wish. Uh, for data verification. So Andreas Beck, I'm just asking um, the final question to all of you, a short answer. So if I had a magic stick and I would give you one wish about uh, what you would have liked to get for verifying or for pushing forward f uh, fair data, what would be your number one? If you have still any wishes. I will give you one that is a bit of a, maybe I don't know if you relate to it, but I would like to have good data. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> you mean because if you make fair data and the data, yeah, because you know at the end of the day is a uh, fair data requires good data, right? You put data Absolutely. in a good shape to con yeah. for yeah. consumption. True. But yeah, if it's not good, <laughs> you're not going to go far, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Philip, you do you have a wish? Uh, yes, I, I think convergence of what the fair metrics and the fair criteria what is fair data with reference and good tools to assess that yeah. or excellent in, in, yeah thanks tom i i think andre hit the nail on the head it, it's, it's how do we make our data fair at birth and you know both from an r d standpoint from an interacting with cro standpoint interacting with publishers. I mean, we, we've got to figure out how to incentivize people so that when it's created, it's already fair. Cool. And Hans? Well, I would love to have a one to say when we work with customers and there's an ontology that's cleaned up or some data that's cleaned up, that's not kind of competitive advantage, but they think it's competitive. that I could mm -hmm. hit them with my one and say, contribute it back, please, so that we, we work together more on this pre-competitive data and align. That's why I'm a huge fan of the Pistoy Alliance, Fair Plus and others. I think that's where the magic will happen. And that comes close to your fair, verified data, right? Mm -hmm. Verified data more and contribute to the public space more. I think this is exactly in line with, with my wish. Uh, so I think I'm really uh, hoping that we will all work together um, on an open public private semantic infrastructure of fair data and services. I think everybody will benefit from it. And um, also academia should be uh, open as much as possible. And uh, I think we really can uh, do this as an industry. And I think with this for the last two minutes, I don't see Megan, but if I'm, I don't know if she can chime in again our host to uh, close this meeting. Maybe we wait another 20 or 30 seconds. Uh, Megan, are you coming back? Or if not, then it's, ah, she's coming. OK. Yeah, a bit of a delay there. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And um, I hope you enjoyed the session. Um, a big thank you to our speakers and our sponsors. And don't forget that next week's session will take place at the same time. Also, just a brief reminder that you can catch some of our speakers today um, at D4 Global, a virtual event taking place in October. Um, finally, we will also be following up with a transcript of the webinar and, where possible, links to the reference use cases um, so that you can make the most of the session. And I look forward to seeing everyone next week. Thanks again now. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.
bye bye thanks for joining thanks for participating thanks very much take care